Okay, let's gradually start and hopefully others will join us when we are going on. Uh, welcome again, good morning. Um, my name is Nasaran Ranjbar. I am a managing editor of uh, Journalists and Applied Sciences. Just before we go to our main topic, um, I wanted to give you a short introduction about SN Applied Sciences. Um, this journal uh, is launched in 2018. It is a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary journal which uh, bridges different fields such as chemistry, physics, engineering, earth and environmental science together and create a platform for the articles which have a wide scope and field. Uh, since December last year, uh, the journal is fully open access uh, and uh, looking forward to, receive, um, to receiving the high quality research and review articles. Um, today I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Vina. Actually, I met Vina in 2018 uh, in EMRS conference. So uh, that was a very nice time. And we uh, spent a lot of time together in that conference and we talked a lot at that time. She was the invited speaker uh, in the conference and she gave a wonderful talk that basically everybody was just uh, uh, attracted uh, by her research and her topics. And uh, I could convince Vina that, uh, okay, as an applied science is a nice platform, it's a multidisciplinary platform. And up to now, she was convinced to publish two articles with our journal. Uh, and um, okay, let's see, I will give us a very short introduction. I am sure that Vina has more to talk about herself. She's working as a professor in uh, UNSW University in Sydney. And uh, she worked on a broad range of topics, but the most important ones are recycling, sustainability, especially recycling of wastes, such as electronic wastes, and uh, green manufacturing. So um, her topic is very, uh, I would say, trendy and hot. Uh, and is of interest everywhere because we really need uh, recycling of materials. Um, and today she is going to talk about, in general, of course, introduce her topic, the science of microcycling and selective synthesis of materials from waste. Uh, she gave us, she will give us a general introduction about her work. And of course, uh, uh, later she will go to details of the two articles that she published with SN Applied Sciences. Um, okay, so before I give the words to Vina, I just want to ask you to keep your cameras off because just because of to make sure that we have a good connection. And also, if you had any questions, you can write it in the chat box and I will ask it from Vina at the end. Um, meanwhile, the, the, the webinar, if you also had any issue to connect or anything, you can just write me. I'm taking off the care of the chat box and I am here for you. Thanks. So Vina, please, we are looking forward to uh, see your presentation. So I will stop sharing uh, my my screen and it's yours. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to just try and uh, see if I can share my screen now. Uh, and let me do that now. Um, can you see my screen? Um, so just wanted to double check. Uh, Nastaran, are you able to? Uh, See the the screen and the slides. Yes, yes, um, everything. So fantastic. Fine. Yes, thank you. I want to first start by thanking you for um, for this opportunity and a tremendous honor to present uh, to um, on on uh, the topics that we've been publishing in SN Applied Science Journal. And indeed, it was uh, such a pleasure to meet with you all those years ago and. Uh, 
really pleased to have had the honor to um, meet you and to subsequently, of course, uh, publish some of the work. So as Nastaran said, we are, um, you know, really focusing very much on recycling and sustainability. Uh, but one of the key things that uh, I want to share with you, our journey today, is this whole new science of micro recycling and how we've been able to show that to some extent, a lot of the traditional ways of thinking about recycling need to really change. And we need to really start to think about new ways of recycling. And this is why um, I'm taking this opportunity to talk about micro recycling and really give you a bigger picture on um, you know, what we mean by it and what are the benefits? Why would you want to take on this approach um, and as my um, uh, title here says, that we want to really start to think about synthesis of materials from waste, um, not see waste as a problem, but see waste as an opportunity. And uh, to be able to do that, of course, we have to understand, you know, that waste can be very complex because there's so many different kinds of waste uh, materials, whether it's electronic waste. So uh, some of the work that we've been looking at, for instance, what we've published in uh, SN Applied Science around uh, batteries and also uh, packaging uh, materials. And in both of these examples and many others, uh, we've got multi-materials. We've got different kinds of uh, metals and uh, metal oxides and, and potentially carbon. So you can imagine that when you've got these mixtures, um, it is never going to be easy to adopt traditional recycling solutions. And this is why we need to start to consider some new uh, approaches and new science to enable us to do recycling. So basically just to uh, start uh, my talk here, what, uh, you're seeing here is a, just a highlight of Smart Center at UNSW. We're looking at um, not only recycling and materials and the transformation, of course, as a result of that, new technologies, new products, um, but also on the other hand, working with um, our industry partners and end users to really translate a lot of our research of materials processing and green manufacturing into practice. So what ultimately, of course, we're looking at is um, sustainable materials and processing with uh, benefits uh, for our environment, uh, social and economic benefits. So that's uh, really the, the bigger picture. Uh, but if I can uh, take a moment to really share with you for Smart Center, it's about sustainability of materials um, and uh, of course, the research and technology that we are doing uh, has got a vision that we want to be able to convert waste into high value materials. And if we can show that it is possible to um, really, you know, as much as possible locally in a regional area, carry out some of these materials transformation, then we don't have to transport waste over long distances. Uh, and that, of course, then can help local economies. Um, so. Uh, really this whole sort of solution that we're talking about, uh, we have to ultimately think about how these solutions can be converted into practice. And this is where I will touch upon very briefly on micro factories. And these are the kinds of technological solutions that we are uh, piloting uh, at, at UNSW in Sydney. Um, and, and really, again, the overall goal is how do you take that micro recycling science and develop these technologies of micro factories so that ultimately we can unlock the value that's embedded in our waste materials. Um, but it is, of course, a global challenge. You know, everybody's got batteries and e-waste um, uh, types of uh, challenges uh, to, to deal with. So if you think about the bigger picture and how do you actually solve uh, these types of challenges. Um, we actually like to think about it as a laterally integrated solution. And what I mean by this is that if you look at uh, some of these areas that you are seeing in the middle of this uh, diagram, or uh, this Venn diagram, is that we've got different kinds of waste in our society, whether it's about electronics, batteries, textile packaging, and polymeric waste. And, and of course, it's not possible that for one particular industry to solve that entire problem within its own boundaries. So what we are really talking about here is, is a collaborative effort 
and that collaboration and that lateral integration where waste from uh, one area, one particular factory could well, or one sector could well become a useful feedstock or a resource for another um, business and another operation. So if we can start to think laterally, and if we can imagine that all of these solutions is that we need to have collaborative um, efforts between different industries. And of course, uh, that whole technological ecosystem needs to be developed in a completely different way. So it's not about just working integrated solutions their own factory areas or within their own boundaries but rather thinking about uh, selectively synthesizing materials um, using other people's waste resources so for instance the kinds of things that uh, we've now uh, commercialized as we've shown that it's possible to to take waste tires and utilize that in the process of making steel. Mollycorp is a steel making company, our industry partner, and, and they are now utilizing uh, the kinds of technological advances that um, uh, we are uh, showing works because tires are uh, rich in, in hydrogen. And what we are showing is that for, for doing and making green steel, we can actually use input of um, hydrogen coming in situ directly from tires inside the steel making furnace. So these are the kinds of examples of solutions we're developing. Um, and another example is where Nespresso through the coffee pods, um, you know, has got, of course, uh, aluminum in those coffee pods. And the ability to harness uh, that metal is uh, another great opportunity for us to harness that high quality aluminum and use that for production. Uh, some of the other things we're working on is looking at uh, plastics, for instance, that might come from e-waste and using those plastics then as feedstock for making basically plastic filaments. And these plastic filaments are then being used by our industry partners, as you can see here, UMEC, where we can indeed show that plastic filaments made out of 100% waste plastics can actually be utilized for 3D printing. And so in all of these areas, it's showing that connectivity between waste and that value creation uh, and that uh, collaboration between various um, types of companies, uh, whether you're somebody who's collecting e-waste or whether you're someone who's manufacturing a component for, uh, for our built environment. So speaking of built environment, another example I wanted to show you recently, we've just launched um, a partnership that has shown with a, a property developer, Mervac here in Australia, um, and they have actually started to uh, utilize um, our, our demonstration products, which are our green ceramics in the uh, building and construction sector. So again, very different kinds of inputs like waste textiles and glass that then becomes a feedstock uh, to replace some of the traditional stone-based materials. So all of these are examples where um, we can show that it is absolutely feasible uh, to achieve uh, ultimately uh, recycling and remanufacturing and all of those to come together. So the focus on e-waste, of course, is uh, such an obvious one where we know that that's a significant amount of uh, waste that is generated globally. Um, and indeed, uh, from our point of view, uh, to showcase that we need to have very uh, different kinds of solutions, uh, depending on whether it's a plastic that I was referring to earlier, or whether it's metal or indeed batteries. So um, really just uh, moving forward here, what you are seeing is an example of our micro factory and, and indeed uh, the kinds of solutions that we are developing include the ability to process metals, uh, depending on the kind of metal, you can see some of the furnaces at the back um, and, and indeed depending on the kinds of temperatures that are needed, processing oxides. And, and one of the focus talks of my talk today is uh, focusing on zinc oxide. So I'll get into that in, uh, in a moment. Uh, but all of this really just comes back to one simple point that ultimately we need to understand that we've got to go beyond the, the traditional ways of thinking about recycling. We need to go beyond reduce, reuse, recycle, and we need to start to think about a fourth R. And that fourth R of reform is really just saying that when you've got um, really complex waste materials, you don't only think about converting like for like, um, you know, you don't just think about a plastic becoming the same 
you know, water bottle becoming the same water bottle again, um, or the exact same ceramic becoming the same product again, but rather imagining that if you were reforming, um, let's say the structure or the chemistry of the material, how could you engineer and create a highly engineered product that is customized for different kinds of applications? So it's very much thinking about the scope that our products evolve with time, uh, but even if our products format changes, the functionality might change, but at the fundamental level, um, elements that are embedded in our ways that used to be an older product that has now become obsolete can actually be reformed and can be brought back to life in a whole new form again. And this is where the, the strategy of thinking about reform comes in. What that means, of course, is that we've got to start to see waste resources um, in, a, in the form where it is very complex. So you can see here now in the middle of the screen um, that we've got basically the circuit boards uh, that we've uh, got from our e-waste. And we have now shown that is absolutely possible um, to produce what you see on the right hand side is high quality metallic alloys. And this, of course, means that um, from, from our context, taking different kinds of circuit boards um, and converting them into various alloys, you'll see some of them are more red in color, basically copper based, or some might be more tin based um, alloys. And all of this, of course, is a way in which we can showcase that these kinds of uh, micronizing technologies uh, that we are now starting to develop uh, can be done on a small scale. And some of the outcomes here that uh, you will see is that what we are showing is we have created, uh, depending on uh, the kinds of temperatures and that selective conditions under which we process these kinds of waste resources, in this case, the waste printed circuit board, where depending on the temperature, like I was saying before, through our thermal micronizing technology, we've created either predominantly tin-based alloy or indeed copper-based alloy. And that's important because, you know, you can imagine if you were putting all of that together in a smelter, uh, you will never be able to have that precision and that fine-tuned control from waste. So it is also important to understand that the benefits of doing on a, on a, a micro setting that we are talking about, of course, the scale depends upon, you know, what is the capacity of your furnace and, and how much feedstock you want to process, but it is certainly a lot, lot smaller than what a traditional smelter uh, would, be, would be typically expected to do. Uh, so this is really where selectivity comes in depending on various conditions like temperature. And again here, just some information on the kinds of control we have uh, in, in understanding that we can take at, at a lower temperature, produce one kind of alloy, and then of course move forward at a higher temperature then um, you know, produce uh, another alloy, which now would be a copper rich. So the ability to utilize these types of selective controls, as you're seeing, um, you know, on the screen there, that you can go from a circuit board to an alloy on the right hand side that you see uh, in, in relatively short periods of time. So the whole sort of point about you know, really making these kinds of factories as micro factories and doing it on a smaller scale also allows you to have decentralized facilities so that you can actually start to imagine that the way you would be looking at these factories is that your micro recycling solutions could be producing some very niche, highly targeted uh, metallic alloys. And depending on the input feedstock, you could then be controlling uh, the kinds of um, outputs you have. So in this case, of course, you would have, for instance, um, metals as well as the non-metals that, um, that could be harnessed coming out of these circuit boards. And that's why you can see in this picture here at, at high temperatures um, that you can produce indeed the shiny droplets are metallic alloys and indeed um, the, the darker materials there are some of the non-metallics uh, that can then be harnessed in different ways. So if I come to the topic of batteries, um, if you think about how many different kinds of batteries uh, we already have uh, in our hands as, as uh, for various applications, but also then thinking about all the valuable metals and of course, um, different types of other uh, compounds that might be present in our batteries is that it is not feasible to, to think about 
specific targeted outputs if you were just mixing all the batteries up together. And it wouldn't be a good idea to, in fact, have all of these materials mixed up because of course, what you want to do is you want to be able to harness each of these different kinds of materials separately. They're highly valuable materials. You need to be able to control the chemistry of what you're producing. So indeed, this is why thinking again about micro recycling so that we can actually imagine that various um, operations and various stages in micro recycling can target and focus on different kinds of whether they are metals or oxides um, that, that you wish to harness and produce. So for example, some of the things that we've published in SN Applied Science is basically uh, on, on our zinc uh, containing batteries. And I'll share with you some more of, um, of those results as well. Um, but just to give you a bit of a backdrop there, you can see that a lot of uh, these kinds of uh, batteries that are the handheld batteries, uh, these ones um, predominantly in Australia, many of them are not ending up in recycling streams. In fact, a very small percentage is recycled. So if you can actually imagine that there's a huge opportunity that a lot of these batteries that currently might end up in landfill, um, or indeed, if even if we are processing uh, limited numbers of them, we certainly have a long way to go um, in many parts of the world, particularly when we're talking about the, the, the ones that are the non-rechargeable uh, batteries. The non-rechargeable ones, of course, will end up producing more and more waste because they may end up in landfill. So the opportunities are indeed tremendous. And I won't go into all of these details, but really just to highlight that in a battery, you've got, of course, many different components. And that's why we know that if we have to harness all these different kinds of materials um, that we've talked about, uh, then we need to, of course, imagine that uh, various processing streams have to really be uh, dealt with separately. Um, and, and if you wanna, for example, produce, uh, for instance, zinc and, and zinc oxide, as I'll show you today, uh, you don't want that to be mixed up with some of the other materials, for example, uh, that might be present in that particular battery. So you do, do want to, yes, take advantage of um, you know, all the, all the possible elements uh, that you can harness. So think about this recycling as going down to the very basic elements and thinking about how you might be able to harness it in a form that whether you can harness it as an oxide um, or indeed as a metallic form, they're all gonna be extremely useful. So look, without getting into a lot of details there, but what we are really looking at is, uh, for instance, in this particular case with the zinc um, carbon batteries, uh, that they, they do account for a significant proportion, 19% of total handheld batteries. Um, and really, as I was saying before, uh, a very small fraction is actually reprocessed um, right here. And in fact, even that reprocessing is really just mechanically separating them out um, as, as different kinds of batteries. But ultimately, it's about producing the high value materials and this is why the focus of this research has been very much around, uh, you know, harnessing and producing zinc oxide as one example. Um, so ultimately the, the challenges for all our batteries and e-waste is lots of different kinds of materials, mixtures, and, and thinking about conventional recycling where, you know, you might be looking at large scale and you might be focusing on a single output from waste. What we're talking about here at micro recycling level is ultimately to have modular systems that can then harness multiple types of value added um, uh, resources. And that's really ultimately to channel them towards manufacturing more and more materials with tailored properties for different applications. So it's really with a very clear target and focus in mind that we have now developed this concept of micro recycling. And what that then means is that we can ultimately have to design fundamentally the various reaction pathways so we can reform our waste into value added green materials and resources. So the, the paper that we published in SN Applied Sciences on this um, in-situ fabrication of zinc oxide, um, thin film electrode that we did with using our spent zinc carbon batteries. So just as a bit of an insight, and you can see, as I was pointing out earlier, so many different kinds of materials that are, are literally mixed up. You think about all the powdered material that's the inside a battery, 
uh, which has got um, you know various elements like uh, and, and of course the various compounds of zinc and, and manganese, that is the reason why, of course, um, it's a challenge, um, but also recognizing that both zinc oxide and manganese oxide um, are, are indeed extremely useful uh, materials. So from that point of view, um, just to be able to use those materials as our starting point, we have then devised various micro recycling pathways that we are utilizing. And I'll just um, take you through some of these uh, for, um, for our discussion this evening. We've shown actually that our ability to produce these types of electrodes uh, materials really relies very much on our ability to produce um, zinc oxide that we um, have recovered from these types of zinc carbon batteries. Um, and this is why, of course, that specific uh, methodology and producing that um, as much as possible in situ inside that same furnace setting uh, is extremely important. And this is why, of course, we have to control and understand the temperatures and the, the input parameters. So in this case, we know what the input parameters are. We know, of course, as we've talked about what they contain, we can identify those. We know what the chemical composition is and of course, what these various compounds are. But of course, as you can see from some of these uh, studies that these are mixtures and you cannot possibly put them in conventional recycling furnaces and expect that you will get high quality uh, zinc oxide and manganese oxide, for instance. So from our point of view, that becomes a starting point of a really useful input feedstock. And how do you now convert that input feedstock into, of course, the kinds of outputs that we want? So here's an example where uh, you can start to see that our ability to, of course, ultimately um, get to these kinds of outputs. This is, this is the opportunity, the opportunity to produce these kinds of um, high quality uh, oxides has always been the focus of this kind of work. So the ability to produce manganese oxide and zinc oxide and to know its quality is important. But how do you get there? So if, if you were to just for a moment take, uh, take stock and look at conventional zinc oxide production, and I won't get into the details, but the realities are that these are, of course, uh, very cumbersome processes. And um, you know, if, if you were to then look at that, and you compare that to, um, you know, so being on a large scale, that's traditionally what a smelter would do. But if you now compare that to what we are talking about, this is the work that we've published in SN Applied Sciences, really honing in on micro level processing. Uh, what we have done is we have shown that we can actually put the, the battery powder, um, that's a spent powder, and show that it is absolutely possible to create these zinc oxide um, thin films on, uh, on the surface of this uh, porous silicon substrate. And, and this is the kind of work that uh, is possible because if you can imagine that micro recycling science really allows us to precisely control the kinds of temperatures um, that, that we want. So, you know, if we want to be able to, in a very small distance, have that fine tuned control of temperatures. So for instance, you know, removal of, uh, you know, water that might be present in the system. Um, and that then means that it's allowing us to ultimately get to um, conversion of all of these complex compounds uh, into zinc oxide. Um, and then finally, of course, the ability to have that finished um, you know, surface where indeed zinc oxide is, uh, is deposited in a way that we've created a thin film uh, on this porous silicon substrate. And as you can see from some of these um, images here uh, that we've published um, that you can indeed go back and do some very uh, important studies in understanding the kinds of uh, outputs that we have generated. This of course is important because if we are going to fabricate um, the kinds of electrodes for supercapacitors. Uh, and, and if we are going to, of course, I won't have uh, time to get into a lot of that detail. We need to, of course, go, go in and look at its uh, performance very carefully. So one example of a result I've picked up from our paper in SN Applied Sciences is you can show uh, the remarkable um, difference between um, taking a surface that's just porous silicon, uh, very much non-wetting, and then you now compare that to when ZNO has been 
um, you know, formed on the surface. And you can see what a difference this makes. This then has an important um, outcome in terms of performance of these types of materials, where of course, you're putting it into these kinds of um, energy storage devices. So to be able to uh, give you a quick sort of summary there, these are the kinds of uh, concepts we're developing of micro recycling and, and showing that it is absolutely possible to process waste at a local level and creating value added materials. Um, and some of these micro factories that we are uh, developing uh, for creating these tailored outputs uh, for different applications are uh, facilities, demonstration facilities that UNSW Sydney is already uh, starting to set up. So that selectivity and the thermal synthesis is something that we've also applied in uh, another paper that we published that we've shown for waste flexible packaging. Um, and again, the challenges are very similar as you can imagine when you've got packaging that is multi-layered, you've got materials like both polymeric materials and metal like aluminum in, in a laminated structure that is then used for packaging. How do you actually disengage um, and, and allow for that metal like aluminum to be harnessed? Because that metal is still very good quality metal. And you can't possibly put them into smelters because they're very thin and therefore they would be prone to oxidation. Whereas, if you want to actually get that metal out, you have to, of course, be able to make sure that you get clean metal that can be put back into production. Um, just some very high level numbers in Australia. Again, uh, we've got policies that are coming into effect um, that have got targets for uh, national packaging targets in Australia that have to achieve by 2025 um, that we really want to minimize the amount of um, problematic and unrecyclable packaging um, out of our economies, which means we have to find ways to really recycle um, our materials. And, and that's important, recognizing fully well that um, you know, we have a long way to go when it comes to our recycling rates of packaging. But when you think about complex multi-layered packaging, that's the same problem globally. It's not just an Australian problem because multi-laminated uh, materials these kinds of materials are not easy to actually harness metal because they are all uh, basically got um, polymeric layers. So as you can imagine, whether it's your Nespresso coffee pods, and I'll put up a picture in just a moment, and you can imagine that these kinds of laminated materials um, have got polymers on the surfaces. Uh, but of course, we also know that, that aluminum in there is high quality. So what we've shown you here is um, in, in this paper, and again, in SN Applied Science, all the details are published if anyone's interested to look them up. Uh, but what you can see is an opportunity to, to harness some of that high quality aluminum, but mindful, being mindful of the fact that, of course, um, you've got polymeric layers, um, you know, uh, that, that we have to deal with. So how do you actually harness from this flexible packaging material um, and of course, the amount of metal will vary depending on the kind of and the nature um, of, um, of, of actually the kind of packaging we're talking about. So if we're looking at something like Nespresso pods, like you see examples in this case, they're actually quite rich and they're at the upper end of the spectrum. Uh, you know, so it could be about 80% or so could be metallic in it. So opportunities to really um, harness that and use that in local industries. Um, is, is a fantastic uh, way forward uh, to really show that we can deliver on new science and indeed uh, doing the engineering to go with it. So this is an example of how we've engineered this solution where we've shown that uh, you can see the polymer that's that red in color, which is uh, the surface layer on the top of this uh, packaging is um, quite neatly under the right conditions and right heating conditions, uh, as well as the right temperatures can indeed be isolated so that you can recover clean aluminum. Uh, and indeed some of the polymer can be simply left behind as uh, carbonaceous particles and carbon bearing particles of course, can be easily separated out from the metal. Um, and the metal of course, as you can see from this picture uh, comes out as nice and clean metal. Uh, but this is exactly why we need to do the work to establish the quality of the metal. But you can see, as I was saying before, that uh, the polymeric materials deliver residual carbon. That carbon can also be extremely valuable 
Um, and indeed, this is why we've been able to show that it is absolutely feasible to get uh, two types of outputs. And that's really where micro recycling can be very powerful is recovery of both metallics as well as um, carbon rich materials that can then be harnessed. So uh, if you look at a lot of these results, what's exciting here is for us to actually get into the details and see that actually that aluminum that we recover um, is relatively speaking a lot more um, than of course um, the, the actual uh, slight amount of oxidation that is indeed formed. Um, and that is why we know that the ability to produce that aluminum of relatively high quality is going to be an important thing that we have to make sure that we can uh, deliver. Uh, some of the polymeric materials, as I was saying, forms this carbon layer from the PET polymer. But ultimately, you can see here that these results clearly highlight uh, what can be achieved um, in terms of recovery of, of metal. Uh, but just to give you some examples, the metal quality there you can see is getting pretty close to 98 and 99%. Uh, and that's the kind of quality of metal that is absolutely possible uh, to harness from these kinds of uh, waste packaging. So you can imagine that, you know, it takes a lot of energy um, to produce, uh, you know, metals like aluminium. And if we can uh, recycle it out of all kinds of packaging, um, then it would be a huge, huge benefit uh, for, the, for, for the world because you think about the benefits of doing it locally in a micro factory setting without having to transport it over long distances to aluminum smelters. Um, and, and really doing it in a micro setting means that it is also a uh, relatively lower cost uh, for setting up these kinds of micro factories. Um, the picture of uh, one of those um, that I've shown you up there uh, but it also allows these kinds of decentralized solutions uh, to really start to flourish in different parts um, of Australia and indeed in different parts of the world uh, where you might wish to localize uh, a lot of these solutions. Um, so instead of transporting waste over long distances, you can produce high value metals um, and materials and you can indeed um, create uh, new supply chains where even small recycling uh, businesses can contribute uh, to high quality materials. And what that then means is we can create local jobs and deliver on local impact. So it's, it's across the board, it's taking that science into application and delivering on benefits for our society, uh, environmental benefits, economic benefits, um, and, and ultimately social benefits that are so important. So what we are seeing is our partnerships with our local governments, our industries, and of course, uh, supported the research supported through our federal government uh, research schemes is, is an important driver to deliver some of these outcomes. So I'm not gonna get into too much more of this detail, but really just to show you that a lot of the future work that is uh, you know, something that we are developing is going to be expanding into more and more of our batteries recovery of, again, uh, high quality metals, for instance, just to give you a bit of a sneak peek on some of the new work, you can see we're now moving forward with uh, lithium ion batteries and processing, of course, um, valuable metals like cobalt are, are important. So ultimately, um, being conscious of the time, uh, just to be able to uh, finish off uh, my talk, want to really highlight the fact that micro recycling science has really shown that we can selectively synthesize green materials from waste. Um, we are of course in the early stages of this journey um, and uh, certainly as we develop micro recycling science and the fundamentals and the applications into solutions and technologies like micro factories, they can really help us harness and enhance um, you know, our sustainability and really produce these new circular material solutions uh, for manufacturing. Uh, so I really want to acknowledge and thank uh, Nastaran for a very kind invitation to speak here today. And uh, really it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to share with you uh, some of the work that we've been doing at Smart Center uh, at UNSW. So thank you so much again for this uh, tremendous honor and opportunity, Nastar. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Vina. Thanks for your amazing uh, talk, like always. <laughs> I have uh, some questions in the chat box. So actually somebody asked if it is 
possible to visit your micro factory? I mean, I can, I have asked if it means virtually because not all of us can just come to Australia and visit. So I don't know if I know that you are expert or basically your university and you to create very nice videos uh, which elaborate the work. So maybe you can address this question in that way. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. You're right, uh, Nasser, and indeed, um, uh, some of the, uh, the work um, that has been showcased through a few video productions uh, that UNSW has put up on the Smart Centers website. Uh, so certainly uh, people can have a look at our website of um, uh, smart smart.unsw.edu.au uh, but uh, but of course absolutely if people are in sydney or are visiting and traveling um, everyone is very welcome uh, to uh, to reach out and we would be uh, very honored to welcome you to our smart, our uh, micro factories um, uh, to to give uh, people a a tour through it and uh, very happy to share that but in the meantime as you say where it's not possible to travel uh, yes uh, yes certainly have a look at the videos on the website okay yeah. perfect and i have another question here uh so about question about your collaborations let's say on inter international collaborations because you talked about australia and the targets that the the country or let's say the government has set uh to have no uh waste export uh so um can you also um, let us know like what about the international uh initiatives do you collaborate with some of the countries or you are hub in australia or do you know or do you work with other hubs uh yes Europe absolutely. or us Yes, yes, indeed. So indeed, where we've got so maybe I can address the question in two ways. Um, the the work that we are doing in Australia at the moment, the export bans that have uh, come into effect and are about to be implemented over the next few years relate to materials like plastics and glass and tires. Um, and, and so all of that means that, you know, one step at a time, we've got to solve these problems. Um, like the e-waste plastics I was talking about. But the advantage, um, for example, with, um, with taking some of these kinds of materials like zinc oxide, the benefit of collaborating with, and indeed we have one collaboration with the university in UK and one in, in, in the, indeed Netherlands also, um, is, um, uh, is, is um, you know, on using the materials that we produce. So if you think about zinc oxide as an example of a material, we can effectively have our university collaborators who can then take those and put them into, into devices um, and various applications. So the manufacturing process of making, let's say, a finished product um, can be done by others, uh, of course, for us to be able to show that recycling can produce the kinds of materials um, that can be utilized by others is a perfect collaboration. So we are always very welcoming of um, any collaborations that people want to uh, get involved in uh, with us. We, we are delighted and indeed we'd be very happy to, to do what we're doing with some of our collaborators um, you know, overseas that I was mentioning. Um, so we're very happy to have other people ask us for some of our recycled materials uh, like the ones I mentioned uh, so we can start to look at, uh, you know, how recycled materials are performing in various applications compared to using the traditional virgin sources. So the more we can collaborate, the better it is, because if everyone starts to put it into various applications, we can actually welcome more and more of these opportunities. Uh, so okay, absolutely perfect. look forward to that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And my um, the last question that I have here, uh, basically, um, addressing the recycling of batteries for telephones, for mobile phones. Uh, do you have any special collaboration with, I mean, we have few uh, famous, let's say, uh, tele mobile companies. Um, do you have also collaboration with them because they are actually, they should be interested in what you are doing because they probably can use again this recycled material in their process, which reduce their costs. So do you have any example of um, the name of the company? Just uh, if some people are yeah. interested, let's say. Well, oh, look, I mean, the, the one company we collaborate with in Australia okay. is uh, called TES, T-E-S. 
and TES is a multinational. Now, of course, we collaborate with the Australian business, uh, but certainly I can imagine that TES are having locations across the world. But from our point of view, absolutely, that's a very important point that we should be um, you know, having more of these kinds of collaborations because um, companies that have got uh, these kinds of requirements uh, will certainly be interested and would benefit from using more and more recycled materials um, as part of their business. Um, so absolutely, um, the collaborations in Australia uh, where we've got uh, partnerships with industry, um, the industry and government partnerships allow us to have this uh, research hub and the research hub, which is on micro recycling has been funded through the federal government as well as um, the companies that are in Australia. Uh, and, and I think to me, that's a very important point that ultimately we do want end users uh, like companies to start to really uh, think about ways in which they can, they can incorporate recycling and recycling solutions and materials, um, because that's the only way we will uh, promote and grow more and more recycling opportunities. That's true, that's true. So they were the questions I could see in the chat box. Let me check again. It looks that more or less it was like that. So I just wanted to thank you again for your all your time and of course the participants. So I think we probably send um, an email following this webinar to share this information, the website of your university and your micro factory so people can just again follow up and maybe contact you if they are interested in the collaboration. So thanks again. For, uh, from all of you for your time and hope to see you in the next webinar of us and applied sciences so have a nice day and we not thank a special thanks because i know it's late there in australia <laughs> thanks for your time and see you hopefully soon next time in another conference maybe i look forward to it i look forward to catching up uh, hopefully in the near future thank you thanks the invitation. a lot thank you bye Bye. 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 Bye.